pine hutch made from recycled pine timbers. And look at this top. This board is over 18 inches wide. We know where it came from, and we think it's over 200 years old. The hutch features glass doors at the top, drawers with dovetail construction, and flat panel doors. I'll show you how to build it next, right here in the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram and is made possible by... Well, before we get started today, I want to show you a new piece of equipment that we have here in the workshop. Some of our friends in the tool industry took pity on us when they saw how long it takes me to recondition these old pine timbers to make furniture. So they said they'd loan us a machine for a while, and this is what we got. It's known as a wide belt sander. What it has is a 37-inch wide belt that's 60 inches long. And the advantage over a drum-type sander is that this long belt runs cooler so it doesn't get gummed up as quickly. Also, there is a conveyor belt which feeds the material through the machine. And it can run from 5 to 50 feet per minute. So we're pretty excited about having this. Now, before we run this board through the sander, I want to make sure there's no metal in it because any metal will shorten the life of the abrasive. So I'm going to take my metal detector and just scan over it. Make sure there's no bits of iron left. Pretty good so far. Oh, all right, there's one right there. Once we take that one out, we'll be all set. I'm just going to use a nail set and punch it through. Okay, let's check it. That's good. Now, if you'd like to build a version of our old pine hutch, a measure drawing is available, and you'll hear more about that before the program ends. Now we're ready to run the board through the sander. I've set it up with 36 grit paper for the first pass. But before we use any power tools, let's take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Well, now I want to switch to a finer grit belt. But doesn't that machine do a great job? All right, that should do it. I've made all of my adjustments. Now we'll run it through with the finer grit. Okay, well now I've got it ripped a little bit wider than the final piece I'm going to need, and I want to turn my attention to fixing this split that's in the middle. Now this split goes all the way through, so I'm going to just take a couple small wedges and pry it open, and then get some glue down in there, and we'll clamp it up. Now that I've got some glue in there, I'm going to get a brush and see if I can spread it around so I have a nice, even coat. All right, while that dries, let's make a couple dust frames to guide those draws. For the last few minutes, I've been working with some three-quarter inch plywood for those dust frames. The pieces that go across the cabinet need a quarter inch wide groove a half inch deep. For that, I've got my dado cutter set up at a quarter inch and a feather board to hold it against the fence. One pass through on one edge, turn it around, run the other edge, and the groove is perfectly centered. For the last few minutes, I've been making a sample tenon to check the fit, and that's just right. Now, to make the tenons for the cross pieces, I've widened the dado to 5 eighths of an inch, set up a sacrificial strip so the dado head won't hit the metal fence, and adjusted the height so that after a pass on each side, I have the exact thickness of the tenon. With some glue on the joints, we'll slip the parts together and clamp them up. Just pin these intersections with some brads, then I can get rid of the clamps. These are the actual sides for the hutch. There's one long board, and then a narrower piece that's glued to the front with biscuits. I've sanded all the pieces smooth and even and cut them up so that they're square. I've also laid out the location of some dados that I need for the fixed shelves and for those dust frames. To make the dados, I'm using the table saw. I've set up the stacked dado head cutter, 
to the right depth, and we'll run the pieces through. Now I'll just back the fence off for the next dado. I've now installed a sacrificial strip on my fence, slid it over so it's right next to the blade, to make a rabbit for the top of the cabinet. With a couple adjustments to the setup, I raised the dado a bit higher and narrowed it up. I've made a rabbit along the back edge of the cabinet to receive the backboards and the back plywood. The upper section of the cabinet has adjustable shelves. To support the shelves, I'm going to use these clips. This jig is handy for cutting a series of holes an inch apart. I clamp it in place, and then I set my router, which has this collar, into this large hole. And when I plunge it down, I get a quarter inch hole for the clips. That's all there is to it. That takes care of the sides. Now let's work on the countertop. Now this is the layout that I need to remove this material to allow the top to overhang the sides. I'll start with the circular saw and finish it up with the jigsaw. Now's a good time to round over the edges of the countertop using a 3 8 inch radius fit because after the cabinet is assembled, I won't be able to get the router in. Now the shelves and the dust frames are installed in the dados, first by installing some glue right along the edge of the dado. Set it in place and attach it by toenailing some brads through the frame and into the cabinet. Before I put the countertop on, I'm taking the time to put the bottom of the upper cabinet in place. Now I'm ready for that top, so I've lifted the side above the workbench a bit so that I can slip the piece in, and then I have to slide it to the back. All right, a little bit of glue in all the dados for the opposite side, and we'll set it in place, line it up, and nail it on. The top piece just sits in the rabbits. Again, I just secure it with some brats. To close in the back of the lower cabinet, I'm just using a piece of quarter inch plywood. You're never going to see it. For the last few minutes, I've been starting to work on the back of the upper cabinet. That's going to be made up of the pine boards because they're going to be seen. To join the pieces edge to edge, I'm going to use a tongue and groove joint. And I'm using the same procedure that I used on the dust frames. Before I install the backboards, I want to put this cleat at the top of the cabinet. The cabinet's narrow, and I'm afraid when it's all loaded up, it might be a little bit top heavy. This way, we'll have a strong cleat to attach it to the wall. Now it's just a matter of slipping the pieces together and attaching them with some brads. No glue. I want them to move. All right, well, let's stand it up and see what we've made. Well, I'd say we made pretty good progress in the first day. Tomorrow we'll make the face frame, the doors, and the drawers. Well, good morning. I got started today working on the face frame of our hutch. I machined the parts out of some old timbers that I picked up. Now, they were sold to me as pine, but I really think it's spruce. However, it's a nice, tight, straight grain, so it's going to make a good face frame and good doors. I machined the stock down to 1 and a 16th inches thick, and I've dry fitted all the pieces together. Now I want to join the pieces, and for that I'm going to use pocket screws. To cut the pockets, I have this bench top machine into which I can clamp the piece. I have a router with a straight cutting bit, and as I swing the tool down, it cuts the pocket. Now I need a hole for the screw, so I use this long bit through a bushing, and what that does is centers the hole right on the pocket that I just cut. Now all I have to do is the rest of the pieces. It doesn't hurt to apply a little bit of glue to these joints. It'll keep the piece from twisting. And I like to clamp it in the exact position before I actually drive the screws. The screws that I'm using are pan head screws with self-drilling tips 
made especially for this type of application. You can see how it pulls the joint tightly together. Now you'll notice that on this small center block, which is between the drawers, I had to offset the pockets. Otherwise, they would be lined up. Now, even though the glue hasn't set on this frame, you can see how strong it is with just those screws. I've applied some glue to the sides of the cabinet and those dust frames. Now, position the assembled face frame, clamp it, and then attach it with some brads. Now, you'll notice that I'm wrapping these door openings with these small beaded pieces. And how I actually make them is over at the router table. I use a quarter inch beading bit. One pass is all it takes. The corners of the pieces are simply mitered. I apply a little bit of glue before I assemble them. Now you'll notice that up here at the draw openings, I'm not gonna use this detail because I have overlay draws. The face frame for the upper part of our cabinet is made a little bit differently. I machined the beads in the rails and styles first. Of course, you still could make pieces and apply them but I thought it would be a little bit faster this way. I fitted the pieces together, and the last piece to do is this center style. Now I've made holes in the back that correspond to the shelf pin holes in the side using the same jig. With the piece cut to the right length, the first thing I wanna do is make a miter cut and then nibble away the material of the bead. To fit the style into those notches that I just made, I need to miter the corners, just the bead, using the same setup. Well, let's check the fit. That's good. Now I'll assemble the frame with pocket screws and attach it to the carcass, just like I did with the lower one. Now for some doors. I'm starting with the lower doors, and the first step is to run a groove in the rails and styles, which will receive the panel and the tenons from the rails. I have my stacked dado head cutter set up to 3 8 width, half inch high, and I have a feather board to be sure that the stock stays tightly against the fence. Here I'm making one of several cuts to form the tenons on the ends of the rails. Here I'm making the first of two cheek cuts using my tenoning jig. This allows me to hold the piece safely as I run it through. All right, now we're ready for a little bit of assembly. Glue in the groove where the tenon sets. No glue where the panel is gonna go, which is just a piece of 3 8 inch thick pine. Fits into the groove. And when all the pieces are together, we'll clamp it up and make another one. ready to start making the glass upper doors and it's very much like making a window sash. In fact, the router bit set that I'm using is a sash making set. One bit is the one that's already in the router. The other is the corresponding bit, which I'll use a little bit later. I want to run all the rails and styles through giving me this profile. This narrow piece is the mutton which divides the door into two lights. For that, I have to run the profile on both edges. Now I'm ready to start making the tenons on the ends of the rails. And what I've just done is nibbled away some material so that the router bit won't have to work as hard when it makes this cope. Now that first pass made one side of the tenon and the cope gut. Notice that I've used the backer block to prevent tear out on the back side. For the tenon on the opposite end of the rail and for the mutton, I need a slightly different backer block. I've taken a scrap and cut a profile using the bit that's now in the router so that it matches the molding of the rail. I've made the shoulder cut on the other side of the tenon. And finally, a cheek cut to complete this tenon. The styles of my top door get mortises to receive those tenons. 
I'm using my dedicated mortiser with the quarter inch chisel to mill them out. Now let's see how these pieces all fit together. It's pretty good. Now we have a decision to make. I could use two pieces of glass, but it would be difficult to put clips along this mutton. So if I remove this rib, I can then have one piece. And I think the easiest way to do that is to just clamp it in the side vise and use my block plane. And that should do it. All right, with a little glue in the mortises and on the tenons, we'll put all the pieces together and set it in some clamps. So now it's time to build some drawers. I'm using half inch pine to build the box and then there'll be an applied front. The first step is to make a quarter inch groove, a quarter inch deep in the sides and the front part of the box. Now I've widened the dado head to one half inch, pulled back my fence, and made a dado that will receive the back of the box. The sides of the drawer are going to be joined to the front with half blind dovetails. So I've set up my dovetailing jig, and I use that in conjunction with my router that has a collar and a dovetailing bit. The collar follows the fingers of the jig, and the bit cuts a perfect dovetail. The tails get cut in the sides first. With the draw front mounted in the top of the jig and the finger assembly flipped over, I'm able to cut the pins. The side simply fits into the front. Once you apply a little bit of glue to these dovetails and tap them together, there's not a joint that's much stronger. The back just gets set in those dados, and I'm going to pin them with some brads. Bottom just slides into those grooves, no glue, and I'll attach it with some brads. Then we'll make a draw front. The draw front is a three-quarter inch thick piece of pine, and I'm using this roundover bit to give it a little detail along the edge. Now the draw front is attached to the box with a little bit of glue and a few brads. Now let's see how that looks. That's good. Let's make the other one. Well, now we're ready to hang the doors, so I have to mortise out for the hinges that I'm using. When I remove the doors from the clamps, I sanded them smooth at my sander so that all the joints are even. I've made a little jig to mortise out for the hinges, a piece of half-inch plywood, and the cutout is a little bit bigger than the hinge itself, and that's to compensate for the difference between the size of the collar and the size of the router bit. Now that I've made the initial mortise, I can remove the jig and square up the corners. For that, I'm using this corner tool it has a chisel in it, which you just set into the corner, give it a tap with the hammer, and just take another chisel and remove the little piece of wood left behind. That done, the hinge should fit perfectly, and we're ready to attach it with some screws. The same technique takes care of making the mortise in the style. Okay, well that takes care of the upper doors. Now let me show you what I'm going to do to the lower doors. I want to add a bit of a decorative detail. I think the door is too plain with just the rails and styles. So I want to apply a molding. Now to make that molding, what I did is I ran some stock through the same cutter that made the rails and styles for the upper doors. And then with two passes on the table saw, I got this small profile. I've mitered the pieces at the corners. And for the installation, all I'm going to use is a little bit of glue right along this narrow face. I don't want glue to get on the panel. I want the panel to move freely. So just a little glue on the edge, carefully set it into position, and do that for all four pieces. No brads necessary. All right. Well, that should dress it up. What I'm beginning to do here is form the cap molding that's going to go around 
the top of the cabinet. And the first cut is to make this radius right here. For that, I simply used a one inch round nose bit. To complete the top piece, make this round over, which gives it sort of an OG look, I used a quarter inch radius rounding over bit. Now, using the same quarter inch bit that I used earlier, except in a slightly different setup, I've rounded over the edge of a quarter inch piece of stock, which is this second piece right here. Of course, now I'll have to rip it to width at the table saw. Here, I've made a small cove molding that goes at the bottom of the cap out of some 3 8 inch thick stock. I'll have to rip it to the final width, but to make the profile, I use the top portion of an OG bit. Now I'm ready to assemble the various molding pieces. A little bit of glue. And all I have to do is keep the back edges lined up. The cove goes on top of that. And then to secure it while the glue dries, I'm just going to put in a couple three-quarter inch brads. A little bit of glue on the miters. And I'll attach the piece with some one and a quarter inch brads. Now I want to show you how we secure the glass panels in the upper doors. Simply fit the glass into the rabbet, and then I have these small clips which you just swing up to hold the glass in place. Now before we put the rest of the hardware on, I think I'll do the final sanding, and we'll bring the piece into the finishing room for a coat of finish. For the finish on our old pine hutch, I'm using a stain polyurethane combination. The color is pecan. I'll put on one even coat, let it dry for about eight hours, and then hit it with some steel wool. Then I'll put on a second coat. That'll be enough to protect the piece, but if I want it to be a little bit darker, all I have to do is put on some additional coats. And here's what it looks like with two coats of that stained polyurethane. And it's just the color that I want. Let me show you the hardware we're using. Old-fashioned spring latches. They hold the doors securely closed, and they act as a pull to get them open. Up on the draw fronts, matching brass pulls. And I'm using the same type of spring-loaded latch up here on the glass doors. The glass has been installed. All the shelves are in place. This was a good project, and there's plenty of room for storage.